In Plain Listen takes one of the first secrets of a magic trick that was ever published in the Western world, and then letter by letter transcribes it into a music notation system that I created based on Morse code to then create a full score for solo cello so that one is actually listening to the secret of this early historic piece of magic, but in musical piece form. I've always been really interested in how magic uh, can sort of be recontextualized in other spheres in the cultural world, uh, like the visual arts, performance art, and academia. So, so when, when people, people come, come to the, the performance, perform they will be uh, in small groups. It'll be a very intimate experience and basically get to experience both the uh, live cello piece, as well as the me performing the historic piece of magic. So you will be seeing the visual uh, representation and sort of the visual manifestation of the piece of magic, and then the auditory manifestation of the secret of the piece of magic that you're watching in music form. Welcome to the beautiful Exchange Theater in the new MIT Museum. I'm so happy to see you all here tonight for a very exciting event. Uh, I'm Graham Jones, Professor of Anthropology here at MIT, and I'm so thrilled to be able to present to you tonight artist, magician, speaker, and writer Jeanette Andrews. Andrews, as you already know, is a magician but she makes magic across many different media, developing interactive and sensory illusions via performance, sculpture, installation, and audio. She has presented commissioned works, talks, and performances with the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Quebec City Biennale, the Cooper Hewitt Design Museum, Chicago Ideas Week, and with Columbia and universities, and I hope soon with MIT as well. She has been an artist in residence at the University of Houston and a recent affiliate of Harvard's MetaLab. Her performances have been praised by the New York Times, the Chicago Tribune, and PBS. We're so lucky to have her here with us tonight, uh, presenting after In Plain Listen, this show on Wonder which is a meta performance and lecture featuring several of her previous pieces. After the show, uh, we will convene in conversation with Jeanette. So please join me in welcoming Jeanette Andrews. Good evening. Wonder can be defined as wrapped attention or astonishment at something awesomely mysterious or new to one's experience. 
magic is, is in the filled in gaps that exist within the mind. Are we paying attention? Magic, in its own unique way, uses the very fact that we are often not paying attention at all to very carefully craft and mold perception to show that, in fact, we're hardly paying attention at all. Today, we'll explore the ideas of wonder through two questions. What is magic? And what is the magician? Let's start with a very stereotypical example. Say, for example, a magician asks you to name any playing card. Queen of Hearts, Queen of Hearts she said. And perhaps. There is only one card that is reversed in the deck, and it is, in fact, the Queen of Hearts. Is magic a live thought experiment? Perhaps. It seems to offer almost sort of a psychological playground, this mental bracketing of experience to explore things like epistemology, how we know what we know, ontology, and phenomenology. Magic is a live thought experiment. Is it almost sort of a post-enlightenment way of dealing with and mitigating what Graham Jones might call the disenchantment of our modern world? Is magic a way to sort of explore ideas of wonder and this state of enchantment, but within sort of the confines of reason and logic that seem more well situated to modern and postmodern sensibilities. This sort of way where we can sort of experience and explore the unknown, yet within what we know are explainable means. Secrets, knowledge, and wonder. Another definition of surprise, because surprise can be used as both a noun or a verb, or an archaic form, an adverb. Um, surprise can often be thought of as sort of a, uh, is often, we often kind of contextualize it as a psychological transformation between objects. our expectations of the properties of an object and then how they shift and change based on those expectations. Having spent the last couple of years studying the phenomenal, phenomenological state of surprise, is surprise a sort of temporally extended sensory and cognitive reaction to contradictory states of logic and reason and visceral stimuli that are presented by a known causal agent. In this case, that known causal agent is the magician. Like I said, surprise is often contextualized within transformations of objects and the ontological commitments that we hold about how objects behave and the properties they hold.
For example, something like glass. We understand that even though glass is an amorphous solid, uh, we understand that it is brittle and will break and not bend. We often also think of it as a way to demonstrate a lot of other phenomena in the world around us. Perhaps some of our earliest uh, familiar and fondest childhood early science experiments. this first simple demonstration of refraction that we learn, how this seems to present an almost optical illusion where the bottom of a, in this case, marker, but what is often a marker or a number two pencil, looking bent or broken or distorted in some way. When in fact, it's just the light bending as it's moving from one type of material to the next. The air, the glass through the water, and then back out through the glass and into the air again as they all have different types of refractive indices. Does something like this almost show us that what we think of as illusion and what we think of as reality can coexist in the same way. Would you come help demonstrate that third in? And perhaps an audience would give a round of applause. <laughs> start to melt in your hands, just feel it bend just a little bit more. Stop, we don't want the water to come out. Glass is brittle. It will break and shatter, but it will not bend. is the magician. We often think of the magician 
being that causal agent of surprise. A lot of times sort of without a known causal agent of surprise. Um, then as Mark Fisher, the fellow anthropologist would say, that without a known causal agent, things that are otherwise surprising then border on more towards eeriness. But with a known causal agent, that then, the magician. We do often think of the magician as the one. What happens though, when that gets democratized? When the one becomes the we. This next piece will be presented by several of you. To begin with, you'll start out by hearing an introduction from couple of words from a poem from John Cage, as well as another noted poet, Sasha Steenson. Each now is the time, the space. Each person is in the best seat. Compass of knowledge wound around our ears. In visibility, in position, in the right, intuition, intuition, intuition. The right time, the right space, X marks the spot. The right time, the right space. X marks the spot.
Thank you again, Jeanette. Please join me in. <laughs> and before we proceed uh, to the next part of the program, I have so many people to thank, and there are so many people to thank. Um, I would ask you to just hold your applause for the, for the end. Um, first, I'd love to thank our multi-talented cellist, uh, Valerie Chen. Uh, okay, you can applaud. <laughs> she, she deserves a round of applause. Who's also a PhD student in uh, CSAIL here at MIT, I should add. Um, so the work of many people uh, went in making possible. First, I would like to acknowledge uh, Kate Silverman Wilson at the MIT Museum, who, okay, you can, <laughs> it's hard not to applaud for her. And Kate was involved with virtually every single detail of tonight's program. I'd also like to thank the staff at the museum, uh, Andrew and Kevin, who have been helping tonight, um, Anthony from AV, Miles from uh, MIT Film Production. I would like to thank Kate Gormley, who's here from uh, MIT Anthropology. Hi, Kate. Um, for a tireless support behind the scenes. Um, funding for this program comes from generous support from the Amar G. Bose Research Grant Program, which, according to its website, quote, supports audacious research projects dreamed up by MIT faculty members who take it can't be done as an invitation. Now, clearly, a thinly veiled incitement to bring magicians to campus. Um, so along with my colleague, Dr. Arvind Syatanarayan, uh, who can join me now on stage, um, I proposed a project to apply insights from magic to designing the next generation of data visualizations. Particular thanks go to uh, Al Oppenheim, chair of the Bose Committee and a former student of Prof Professor Bose, who is here with us tonight, also another excellent magician. Um, and I would like to thank the Morningside Academy for Design, MAD, an interdisciplinary hub elevating design at MIT for partnering with us to sponsor this event. Particularly, I'd like to thank Roy, Adelaide, uh, Marion from the MAD team, who are all here with us, along with uh, co-director John Oxendorn. Thank you all. So now we can applaud everybody who made this possible. And now I'd like to uh, invite Jeanette uh, back onto the stage for a conversation with myself and Arvind. And then in the last five or 10 minutes of the program, we should have some time for questions from you in the audience, if you have questions you're burning to ask. Jeanette. Oh. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Am I getting feedback? One of us. It's 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 all of us put together. Okay. Um, yeah. Otherwise, I'll just yell. It's fine. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, Jeanette, it's so wonderful to have you here. Um, and as you mentioned, I've uh, been studying magic as an anthropologist for a long time. Um, and one of the things that's always that's attracted me to magic and that always fascinates me about magic is the element of secrecy. Yeah. And so I don't know if everybody fully appreciated what was happening in In Plain Listen. Um, and maybe just for those of you who maybe didn't notice, the musical accompaniment that Valerie was playing was a transposition of one of the first ever published tricks in the history of magic from Reginald, Reginald Scott's discovery of witchcraft. Correct. Which was the effect that you were performing. Correct. And so I'm wondering, insofar as magic tricks are always about kind of revealing to the audience that you, the magician, have a secret that you're not gonna tell them, mm -hmm. what does kind of titillating us with the secret in another form. What, what, how are you commenting 
on the place of secrecy and magic? Yeah, um, so, so for me, so um, In Plain Listen uh, is something I started working on, um, goodness, about two years ago. Um, and I, I started working on it, it was a commission from the University of Houston, I was the artist in residence there earlier this year. And as part of it, um, I've, I've long been interested in ideas on, um, on things that are hidden in plain sight. Um, because of course we think of magic as being so visual, right? You know? and, um, and I did a sound art piece uh, during COVID um, for the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago um, called Invisible Museums of the Unseen um, that was uh, in a, basically a geolocated audio AR piece um, outdoors. And so I just started to think about, you know, what might magic seem like in other formats? Mm -hmm. and, um, and because I've been playing around with audio so much, um, I kind of thought, okay, I always wanted to do something with Morse code. And it struck me that why couldn't one take Morse code Turn, I just created the um, acrylic piece that's in the lobby. That's the um, musical notation system that I created based on Morse code, um, where you're basically having kind of the dots and dashes translated into, you know, half notes and quarter notes and, and the pauses as, you know, rests and things like that. Um, so it's still maintaining the structure um, of Morse code, but then letter by letter transcribed um, the first uh, text description of a secret of, of magic in the Western world from 1584 um, into the full score is a 44 minute score. So you only heard a short excerpt of it. So it's 44 minutes to basically um, kind of tell the secret um, in plain listen of, of, of that kind of simple piece of magic with thread. But um, that's one of the things I'm really interested in. I'm interested in how magic seems to be kind of in, in response to your question on secrecy. I'm interested in how Magic, in my opinion, seems to be one of the few things left that's still genuinely handed down from person to person and in print books. Um, mm. And so we think of it often in this almost like ways of not archaic media, but like kind of, mm. and how that's these sort of ideas of secrecy, because they are it is such a sort of selected group and then also a self-selected group, um, kind of how that secret knowledge is shared and handed down and who has access to that secret knowledge and the, the media through which that secret knowledge is conveyed. Um, and yeah, so that was, that was just sort of, um, I liked sort of thinking about like the internal structure of, of secrecy, I guess. Yeah, that's amazing. It, it reminds me of, I have a friend who's a lawyer and a mm. magician who tries, has tries so, to- So do I, there are a lot of them. <laughs> do we have any here? Uh, no, oh, that's actually kind of rare. Who, and what he does is try to figure out ways to pr protect magician secrets yes. as intellectual property. Yeah, I have, a, I have a copyright on the last yeah. piece of magic you saw. Oh. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. So one of the ways that he has found to do it is um, to register it as what he calls choreography of that's the invisible. That yep, yeah, that's exactly so what that it's is. It's beautiful to think of that as the music that accompanies the choreography of. Yeah, and so just just to quickly comment on that, um, the last piece of magic you saw with the rose, I've been performing that for. Um, um, oh my God, this is year 25. Wow. Um, yeah, um, I, I appreciate your jaw on the floor. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I've spent now the last two and a half decades on that like 60 to 90 seconds. Um, but my copyright is as a piece of choreography. Oh. So my copyright protects my exact sequence of movements. But similarly, I'm interested in how the way that my copyright is written de facto protects part of the secrets because a magician could read it and know that there's certain <laughs> techniques that I have created that it is, it is copywritten as a derivative work because it's built on historical technique. But then the parts of technique that I created built into what is described as choreography, magicians would know that that is new technique but it is publicly accessible, unlike a patent, this is why magicians don't patent, 
um, because then that is you know technical information. So yeah. So that actually takes me to the heart, I think, in a lot of ways of my next question, um, which is that this is a, a new museum. As you can see, everything is glistening, <laughs> yes. sparkling. Don't new. spill anything, anyone. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hold my tongue. Um, no, that's just you. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think this is probably the first time that we've had magic in the museum. And most people, when they think of MIT, think of science and technology, which is in the name. Um, but I'm wondering how you think about, you've already kind of started to point to some of the ways in which magic is a very complex technological system. But how do you think about magic in relationship to science and technology? What does it mean for magic to be here in this museum? And what does it mean to you yeah, to be yeah. here in this museum? Um, oh my gosh, what a, what a large question. But I think like, um, I'll start with the um, technology question. Um, and I'm sure almost every person in this room is more well equipped to speak on this than I. But um, when we think of, you know, sort of the roots of technology and how we define technology as being, you know, coming from the root techno, you know, and, and so that not necessarily being what we think of as like, oh, this is computers, you know, and that being more of like a methodology and systems for doing things. Um, and so, so bless you. Um, so magic then does fit in very well, I think, with the idea when we look at sort of complex systems to achieve an end task. Um, and um, on the relationship between, um, I'll quickly speak on both, um, on magic and technology and then uh, magic and science. Um, you know, magic and science, of course, are deeply related. Um, so much magic either just is science or <laughs> vice versa. Um, magicians have long had a really um, complex um, and, and um, a very uh, long-standing relationship with scientists. There's many instances, especially, especially when we look in sort of industrial revolution era, of magicians ha being friends with scientists and then having access to new technology or scientific discovery prior to when it was made public. Um, and so magicians were using um, you know, prototypical technology or things like that, um, or early scientific discoveries uh, that then they were using as techniques for magic. Um, and of course, you know, there's the Arthur C. Clarke, Clarke quote, you know, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, um, which I completely agree. Um, uh, on, on, on the uh, uh, technology aspect of it, um, I did a piece about uh, two years ago um, or I get, oh my gosh, it was only a year ago. Um, <laughs> what is happening? Um, uh, that I was an affiliate of Meta Lab at Harvard, which is a, a digital humanities research lab. You are nodding. Um, love it. Um, so the um, uh, so basically, uh, I had been functioning in a completely intentionally analog world. Like I had I just very honestly stayed as far away from technology, basically, as I could because um, of things progressing so rapidly um, and, you know, technology failing, all this stuff. I was like, I have no interest in this. Um, and then once, I, well, once the pandemic hit and I did this AR-related piece, suddenly I was kind of thrust into this, you know, working in these digital forms. and. Um, a colleague of ours um, was working um, on a touring related project and, and said, oh, well, you've you know, read the 1950 Alan Turing paper, right? And I was like, no, dude, <laughs> like, no, I'm not. And, uh, and he's like, read it. I think you'll be really interested in this because it has a lot to do with surprise. Hmm. Little did he know that I had been spending the last couple of years deeply delving into the nuance of structures of surprise. Mm. Um, because I had become deeply fascinated by why the piece of magic at the end with the rose, that is surprising. 
as opposed to the piece of magic you saw at the beginning with the thread, I would argue that is not surprising at all. Hmm. The second you see a magician have any whole object, mm -hmm. and if I were to take out a pair of scissors, if I were to tear a piece of paper, if I were to do <laughs> anything that destroys an object as a person that is you know, <laughs> situated as a magician, you know within our cultural tropes of what a magician is, that that thing is going to get restored, yeah. right? So like that is not surprising. Mm -hmm. The only things that are then make that compelling are the how and perhaps the why, and then the, um, basically then the sort of cleanness and precision of the how. Um, and so I became really interested in the like, why is this one thing surprising? Why is there something else surprising? And then what's the spectrum of things in the middle? And uh, so I read the Turing paper and, uh, and you know, the, the Lady Loveless objection on why, you know, basically um, for folks who are in my camp um, of being like, what? Um, basically in 1950, Alan Turing um, wrote the sort of seminal paper on computational intelligence. This is where we see the birth of a lot of our modern understanding. Um, of what we think of as you know, machine learning. And so in it, he poses the question, can, uh, or is sort of responding to the question of, can a machine take a human by surprise? And why or why not? And he says yes, um, in sort of this famous refutation of Ada, Ada Lovelace, who was a 19th century mathematician uh, and who basically said, no, a machine cannot take a human by surprise. So he's making all these arguments, these really interesting complex arguments about surprise. And um, so that then began, began a project I did last year called Taken by Artificial Surprise um, that uh, pre, uh, pre uh, jet, chat D GPT and all this other stuff uh, myself and Doug Duhaim, who's a, 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 from Yale's Digital Humanities Lab, basically worked together to um, uh, create uh, essentially code in Python based on sort of structures of hierarchies of surprising <laughs> transformations wow. of objects in magic and sort of these hierarchies of what would be more or less surprising based on sort of the system I created. So, um, and then basically the audience uh, watched a performance that was a live touring test. So they saw, <laughs> so they watched a performance, they saw four or five pieces of magic happen, half of which uh, were things that were historic pieces of magic with kind of my modern twists, and the other half of which were kind of algorithmically generated text descriptions of magic that then I invented ways to perform. And they, and they never knew which was which. So it was all like, is, you know, is there some wow. quality to what is being produced in how the human mind both creates and perceives surprise? And what, you know, how do we think about what is, a, as somebody who I've spent the last, you know, several years doing almost nothing but thinking about surprise, uh, it is one of the most sort of nebulous, hazy, gray topics. Um, and so that's, that's, that's where I'm at with technology. I, I wow. think this is the point in the conversation where I need to step aside and let my colleague, who's oh God. A yeah. professor of computer science, take right. over. <laughs> oh boy. Um, so, you know, as Graham mentioned, we have this joint research project that looks to magic and, and tries to draw some parallels to visual communication, yeah. particularly data visualizations like bar charts and line charts. And I feel like I'm already drawing so many connections just based on your performance and even more now from this conversation. But I wanted to start um, with the, the great sort of um, uh, explanation you were offering us for In Plain Listen. Mm. Um, and in particular, I wanted to sort of think with you about the role of perception in that. Yeah. Um, and so in visualization, we have this sort of rule of thumb that's called the data ink ratio. Mm. And it's coined by you know this very famous statistician, Edward Tufte, and the idea behind the data ink ratio is that, you know, as visualization designers, we're supposed to simplify <coughs> and simplify and simplify to get all the, the visual elements that might sort of slow a reader down in trying to glean as much information out of the visualization as fast as possible. 
Uh, now, over the last few years, a lot of visualization designers have been pushing back on that to say that maybe the priority, maybe the goal of visualization design should not be you know, speed um, and simplicity. Maybe there are other things that are also valuable at play. Um, and so I'm curious for you in your work and as you're sort of designing these various performances, how do you sort of balance fast and slow perception? And you know, how do you think about you know, slowing things down in a way that isn't frustrating for your audience? Yeah, um, this is something I think about a lot. Um, and a uh, couple of quick points on this. You know, something, um, I'm very lucky in that sort of the lineage of magic learning that I come from. Um, one of my main mentors uh, was an incredible magician named Eugene Berger. And um, I grew up in Chicago, I live in New York now. Um, but Eugene was known for having slow, deliberate movements. And one of the things that, that um, seeing that and learning that, I think really showed me, especially as a young person, um, was exactly that idea of sort of uh, of sort of the cleanness and clarity. Because um, there's a, a lovely uh, psychology researcher named Amory Danik. Um, she's uh, um, I believe in Berlin now, um, but she studies moments of insight and problem solving. And she uses magic as her main research problem to kind of study these moments when people sort of think that they're um, kind of mentally grabbing on to a secret of magic or not, or when they feel like they kind of maybe have some understanding of a revelation that was mm. completely opaque and now mm -hmm, clear. Mm -hmm. And um, one of her first studies, she talked about, uh, she had, it was uh, a kind of a behemoth. Um, she had a, all of her participants watch, I believe it was, there are 38 or 40 videos of very simple magic effects. And then that kind of, there are obviously a myriad of questions, but what's interesting is that in um, one of the questions they were asked, they had one sort of, you know, like fill in the blank answer where um, they were asked to determine if they thought they had a, a conception of how a secret worked, what they thought it was. And interestingly, one of the effects was not terribly dissimilar from the threat effect that you saw. And what's really interesting about it is there was so much where people were saying they felt like something about the process was obscure or obfuscated in some way. Like they were like, mm -hmm. we felt like there was just something like we couldn't quite follow the steps or we just couldn't quite. Um, and, and so there was just something where there was sort of this element of confusion. And when we think of a lot of, I think, Certainly within like the time that we have all been alive, we think of magic, especially from like the 60s until like the early 2010s probably, as being very flashy, like super literally flashy. And you know, that I think as being sort of this way of when we think about things that are very, um, you know, um, lighting and pyrotechnics and like glitter and flash and dazzle, you know, all that sort of stuff, it do, you do literally have this feeling like, I cannot follow, I cannot see what's happening. And so as a result, it makes, and it's very fast, mm -hmm. right? It's very fast. And so you're just kind of like perceptually overwhelmed. And so what's interesting is then when people have on the converse, when people feel like you have seen everything, when you feel like you have seen or touched or been shown everything to almost excruciating detail, I think that's where a lot of times sort of the idea of impossibility starts to pull through because you don't have those sort of mental loop, loopholes basically of like, eh, well, couldn't quite see everything, or there's something really fast that happened over there that just, I don't know. Um, so I feel like that's sort of the balance of those two things. And also, two, two other quick things is number one, if anybody has not seen or read, if you're interested in this sort of like, um, this data ink ratio or other things on um, magic 
in visual design. Um, Edward Tufte's work, um, he worked with a number of magicians. Um, and right now, the name of his main book, where he has this big chapter on magic, is escaping me. Um, Jimmy and Swiss, I think. Yeah, well, the, I, well, the title of that particular oh, of that work. work. I don't know. Um, anyway, um, it's got a mainly white cover. Um, if that helps anyone who's interested in this. Anyway, um, uh, Edward Tufte's work on magic um, and visual perception is really lovely. Um, and, uh, and in fact, uh, not that this is one of his demonstrations, but I want to quickly lead all of you um, in, in a quick visual demonstration um, that I think will illustrate some of our, our topics is on your seats, everybody, you had a little, um, a little card um, that had on it a plus sign and a circle. And together, we'll all do a little experiment with this in visual perception. Um, everyone, I'll ask you to please um, orient the card so that the plus sign is to your right and the circle is to your left. And hold that card out at arm's length. If it is comfortable and accessible for you to do so, please hold it with both hands. You'll see why this is important in a moment. Um, and I'll ask everyone to please go ahead and close your right eye. So right eye closed. And now please cross the gaze of your left eye. So your left eye is staring at the plus sign and only the plus sign, okay? So right eye closed, left eye, just stare at the plus sign and only the plus sign. And as you continue to stare at the plus sign, very slowly bend your elbows, bring the page straight towards your face. And at a certain point, you should see the circle disappear. When it does, you can stop. And if you'd like to make the circle reappear, please just move it further or closer to your face. Did we get it? If you got it, give me a, give me a wave. Okay, oh, right on. Um, so this is, um, if, if you got this to work for you, um, uh, you've done what's kind of lovingly, colloquially known as uh, finding your optic nerve blind spot. This is where your optic nerve, uh, I, I, I'm like, I know we have an ophthalmologist, optometrist, optometrist apologies, um, sitting in the front row. Um, uh, so your optic nerve is situated all the way in the back of your eye, a um, very tiny portion of your eye that's not sensitive to light in the way that the rest of your eye is. So your brain is essentially having to fill in the missing part of the information with what it thinks should be there. So in this case, it's the, black, the blank black space. So there's so much here on, I think, the sort of ideas on expectation and perception and the way that the mind is constructing both prior experience and expectation based on those visual cues um, that I think, you know, this is just a, a biological example of this, of how often things might truly be really escaping us all the time. Obviously, this is a very concise um, example, but I think we, this is something we see often in your work. Um, and in a lot of what you've been doing in terms of, of data visualization and how people think about prior experience and expectation as we think about the visual field. Gosh, there's so much here. Uh, <laughs> this is fantastic. Uh, so I, I, I really like this, um, this idea of sort of, you know, showing people everything and the, the, the chances that that can sort of overwhelm and things mm -hmm. like that. And, and particularly the way you open the main performance by talking about attention. Mm -hmm. It reminded me of something that one of my sort of visualization heroes, uh, Amanda Cox, who was until recently the chief data officer uh, at the New York Times, talks about, which is that for her, the annotation layer, right, all the, the highlights, the labels, the animation, et cetera, she considers that almost the most important part of visualization design because that's the way she takes responsibility for you know, guiding the reader's attention, helping a reader understand what is important to you know, read and learn from a visual design. Mm -hmm. um, but as I was listening to the way you opened the performance, I realized that you know, besides attention, the thing that I guess I've never heard a visualization designer ever talk about is inattention, mm -hmm. right? Like what are the things that we might be missing or exactly as you just said there, like the things that a reader might be just filling in the, the holes about and, and sort of like telling themselves stories about. And so I'm curious in your work, you know, how do you sort of think about the role of inattention and, and how you kind of play attention and inattention 
off of each other and, and things like that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I won't lie, that's like the keto magic. <laughs> <Right. Yeah. laughs> that's the secret, everyone. Um, but I mean, it really is like, you know, I mean, obviously there's certain things that are very important within a magic performance for a viewer to be focused on. So like, for example, you know, with, um, you know, with the threat effect, if you had not clearly seen that at the beginning the thread was one piece and like seeing that it was like strong and put together and like whatever. If you didn't clearly see that, if I was somehow like doing so, then like, you know, the whole thing is meaningless. If it's not set, so I have to like really clear, clearly draw attention to like what is the beginning premise of how something is set up, what are those initial conditions, etc. Blah blah blah. Thank you for coming. Um, um, and the you know so like that, I think is really important. Um, so we so we think about both the sort of you know people always think of magicians as like oh you're misdirecting us. Which like yes and no because a lot of times for example, me emphasizing here is a length of thread. It is one solid strong length of thread. That's not me misdirecting you from anything. Right. That's me saying, here is something important um, that makes this make sense. Um, so there, are, so there's a um, really a big play between like, here's things I want you to focus on. Here's things I don't want you to focus on. Here's things, if nothing else, from like a design perspective. Here's the moments <laughs> I want you to remember, because. You know, memory is very fallible, and um, you know, just within the structure of any performance or any talk or any, anything like that, um, having key moments that are highlighted. Like I like to try to make my work in a way that essentially it almost functions like these little like vignettes or like mental photographs, where you could be like photo. Like a lot, I do so much where I just stand and pause. So it's like. Here's an image. Here's an image. Here's an image. Like, and so it's just, so again, it's these very clear things of things that are easier to remember, so that then like that cre ends up creating this more holistic picture. So I feel like that's sort of also sort of this very concerted um, attention ideology as it relates also to memory. So we have about <clears throat> five minutes yes. left, and I'd love to see if we could get one or two questions from the audience. If there are if you any. have oh, questions, a, Kate will run a microphone. I see a hand shot immediately. Uh, well. Yes, I'm like center back. Um, oh yeah, I, I, yeah. I, or was that your grandma let you? That was that was the hand that I saw. Yes, me like too. Me rocket. too. Me too. So. It was impressive. <laughs> I've always wanted to ask a magician this question. Let's do it. So for the physical transformation magic. If we were to see it in slow motion, would it show us anything more than what we see in real time? Ooh, great question. Um, no one's ever asked me this before. Um, perhaps. I mean, like, it, it, it honestly depends. I mean, I've had I have pieces of magic where I I had a news outlet. If you search hard enough, you can find which one. It's an international news outlet. Um, take a video of me performing on, uh, I'm from, like I, I think I mentioned I'm from Chicago originally. I was on the uh, Chicago Morning News Station. This was about eight, 10 years ago. And um, they took the video and watched it frame by frame. Oh. And put screen captures frame by frame Yikes. in an article. Wow. Um, and, yeah, yeah, um, and uh, still on the internet. Um, and it was from one of the pieces in the show. And, um, and so they, they did it frame by frame and they said no. <laughs> um, are there other things? Thank you. Um, are there other things that um, maybe yet maybe yes I, I don't know um i don't tend to watch my I some i mean sometimes i do watch my own work in slow motion but it's hard for me 
I'm watching a very different thing than you're watching. Um, I have the feeling based on your question that you would love if you don't already, uh, if you're not familiar with Gustav Kuhn's work. Um, he's a neuroscientist in the UK who studies magic and he did a really lovely study called um, uh, what, um, uh, uh, I have to give a shout out to a major collaborator of mine, Stephen Wood, who's in the audience. Um, uh, this is Stephen, give everyone a wave, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Stephen, um, Stephen and I co-teach a course um, at Northeastern University on uh, the relationship between magic and healthcare. Stephen is a, he runs the uh, acute care nursing program as well as their um, uh, extreme medicine program and um, uh, what is it? What what fMRIs reveal about expectation violation and magic? I think is the name of the study, um, and he talks about how. Um, and then we'll get to your question. Um, he talks about how they had magicians and non-magicians while um, on you know undergoing fMRI watch the same video of magic effect and how the, the um, areas of the brain that are activated in the magicians versus the non-magicians are completely different. <laughs> we are literally watching a completely different event than what non-magicians are watching. So like, yeah, I've watched my performances or other magicians' performances in slow motion because we give each other feedback, but well, I'm, I'm physically watching a different thing, which also is really trippy and weird. <laughs> Um, but Gustav Kuhn, um, K-U-H-N, he's the nicest guy in the world, uh, Goldsmith. And uh, his book was published by the MIT Press, yes. which I believe is called Believing the Impossible. Yes, uh, yes, and it's relatively recent. So um, yes, thanks for, the, uh, thanks for the publication shout out. I'm sure you can get it in the bookstore downstairs. Um, and Maybe one last one, I think we have time for one more. First off, this was a fantastic show. Oh my god, thank you. Um, what is the first magic trick that you did or that you remember doing that stuck out to you? Yeah, great question. Um, first of all, I forgot to ask, what's your name? Yeah. James. James, thank you, James. And what's your name? Jessica. Jessica. Oh my God, all oh, James, Jessica, Jeanette. <laughs> no, um, no, no. Um, so um, thanks for the question, Jessica. So um, I, um, within context um, here, um, I started doing magic when I was four. Um, I got into magic because of flash and spectacle and, and fast, um, and fast attention um, uh, through seeing a Siegfried and Roy TV special. So the first magic I did was a lot of like, now you see it, now you don't, kind of, <laughs> kind of stuff. Um, and then uh, a couple months later, my parents got me a magic set for Christmas, and then I did my first magic performance for my preschool class. So, mm -hmm. Um, and um, the first magic that was not um, some fabricated mental weirdness um, was um, uh, they, by the way, magic sets have not changed. You can back this up, Graham will back this up for you. Magic sets have not changed their contents in at least 160 years. Uh, I'm serious, I'm so serious. The only thing that has changed is the materials uh, and stuff going from like, now this was beautiful turned wood and now it is the cheapest plastic that will break immediately. Um, but a uh, piece of beautiful piece of magic um, that is diabolically clever that many of you probably have or have had um, uh, called the ball and vase. It's originally <laughs> called a Morrison pillbox. Um, and basically, it's like a little stand that, that almost looks like an egg cup, and then you put a ball in it, and you take the ball out, and you like hide it somewhere, and then you put the vase, the lid back on, and you open it, and the ball has reappeared. That was the first thing um, that stuck out to me in terms of performance. Um, and I have one or two things to add before we all part ways for the evening, which is you got to do all of your thank yous. I did not get to do mine, um, which is uh, I have to thank, obviously, Graham for inviting me, and I am such a massive fan of Graham's work. Um, please, I like, if, if you do one thing today, go read Magic's Reason, um, 
your newest I don't book. think anyone's going to do it today. <laughs> no, no, order it today. A few hours um, left. No, no, order it today. It is so, so good. Um, like, I, you know, I was aware of Graham's work and had been reading um, his work before I knew you. And um, it's just so beautifully thought through and just so excellent and um, in, the, in the breadth of understanding on you know, magic and how it's situated within society. And um, so I have to thank you for bringing me here. Um, Can I just say, I signed Jeanette's copy in the green room. I call it the green room. It's the sharp room. And I wrote, I don't know if you saw I it I haven't yet. seen it yet. I wrote, um, thank you for being the one to put these ideas into practice. <laughs> Oh my God. <laughs> I'm now. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, I'm going to cry. Um, um, uh, and I, and this brings me to the, to your, to your second point. I seriously, I'm like, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to fight through it. Um, uh, oh, that got me really emotional. Um, the, um, I never touched on your question about what it means for me to be here. Um, because it means a lot. Um, you know, I spent, I spent my life, especially um, as a young child growing up in magic, with people thinking that magic is something that is easy to do and is really, um, very trivial um, because um, if we look at the history of how magic is portrayed and mainly marketed and mass marketed within society, um, we start to see in the 60s that magic was literally the tagline on like TV magic cards was easy to do. <laughs> Seriously, that was the marketing tagline. So um, when we think about that, and we think about you know the way in which you know we think of party tricks, et cetera. There, there's sort of this this um, this is the public vernacular surrounding magic and magicians, and um, and I am so deeply in love with the back end of what I do and the rich cultural tradition that underlies all of this and the technical tradition and the way that we think about it, the crafting of attention and, and the pacing and the timing and all the, you know, and the sort of uh, visual annotation of things. And, and, um, and I have such a deep love and respect for it. And, and so I think I was always deeply frustrated. Um, and uh, Max Maven, who's one of my mentors and uh, he's one of the most prolific inventors of magic that ever lived, a um, uh, great magician of the 20th century said this, the magicians of the 20th century accomplished a great feat. They took something truly profound and rendered it trivial. And not only is that heartbreaking uh, to hear as a magician, uh, it is also by no fault of any persons in, within that time span. It was a myriad of socioeconomic factors um, that led, led to that. I'm happy to discuss in, in more detail with anybody here. But um, all that to say that um, in my last uh, two seconds, because we're over time um, on this, is that, um, you know, it came to my attention as a teenager how if some, if you, if they had said, you know, hey Jessica, what are you doing on, on, you know, Wednesday night? And you said, I'm going to a magic performance. 150 years ago, that would have carried the same cultural weight of prestige as if you said, oh, I'm going to Broadway or I'm going to the ballet or the opera. And so I kind of became aware of that. Um, at the same time, got really interested in um, in philosophy um, and aesthetics, and you know how magic can be used as a really ripe um, investigative tool to explore visual understanding. And, uh, and so knowing that I come from a tradition that was held in such high cultural esteem, um, I basically, you know, nearly 20 years ago made it my life's work to try to recontextualize magic within both as a performance art and as a thought experiment and to situate it within cultural spaces such as the arts, academia, and museums. And so being here at the MIT Museum, bringing together all of those things has, like I would be lying if I said I was not choked up this morning thinking about being here. Um, so I have to thank 
Graham and Arvin for bringing me here. I have to thank Kate, who's been our like tireless right-hand woman this whole process and one of the most lovely organized people I've ever had the uh, privilege of working with. Um, and namely, I have to thank all of you because you all didn't know really much about what you were walking into and, um, and, and just um, were a wonderful group of people who are deeply curious and passionate and excited to, to be here with us and explore these ideas. Um, so on that note, I just want to thank you all and thank all of you and thank you so much for coming and sharing your evening with us.